everybody. Today's practice problem comes from the sixth edition of Principles of Economics by N. Gregory Mankiw. We're going to do in chapter three, problem number three. So the first thing we have to do is set up the problem. The introduction to the problem goes like this. Pat and Chris are roommates. They spend most of their time studying, of course, but they leave some time for their favorite activities, making pizza and brewing root beer. Pat takes four hours to get brew a gallon of root beer and two hours to make a pizza. So you notice the first thing that the problem is giving is some information about how productive the two people are at making the two goods. So we can take that statement, we can put it in a table that looks like something like this here. So again, Pat takes four hours to brew a gallon of root beer. So we'd put four hours for him here and two hours to make a pizza. So we would put two hours for him here. Chris takes six hours to brew a gallon of root beer. So we would put six hours for him here and four hours to make a pizza. So now we have some basic information on the time required to make each of these items for each of these people. Now, part A of the question says, what is each roommate's opportunity cost of making a pizza? And then it asks about absolute and comparative advantage. But in order to examine that, it's important to remember that we need to deal not directly with the time required to make each of the items, but more directly with productivity or the rate at which each of these people can make these items. So let's think about how to turn these times for root beer and pizza into rates or productivity for making root beer and for making pizza. So it stands to reason, for example, that if it takes four hours to make a gallon of root beer, then Pat can make one fourth of a gallon of root beer per hour. And we could say here that if we're thinking about this in terms of rates, that Pat's rate of making root beer is one fourth of a gallon per hour. Similarly, if Pat can make a pizza in two hours, then, and know that this is not literally true, we don't make half of a pizza at a time, but he can make one pizza every two hours, which if we were to flip that around, we could say that that's one half of a pizza per hour. So we could say that his rate is one half of a pizza per hour. And similarly for Chris, if it takes him six hours to brew a gallon of root beer, then we can say that his rate is one-sixth of a gallon per hour. And if it takes him four hours to make a pizza, then on average we can say his rate of making pizza is one-fourth of a pizza per hour. And in general, you'll notice a relationship here that the numbers here for the rates are just the reciprocals of the time required to do the job. So you can think about your know, rate times the time required to produce a certain amount of output has to equal one. So if you were trying to find the rates when you were given the times instead, you could just say that the rate is just one over the time required to produce a particular amount of output. And then you would get the rate at which these different parties can produce a particular amount of output. So now we have some information that's more directly helpful to us. So just as a reminder for you, if you're given information in, the, in a table that has times, you want to make sure that you convert that to rates rather than just looking at the numbers directly when asked questions about absolute and comparative advantage because otherwise you'll get all the answers backwards. So back to the specific question, it says what is each roommate's opportunity cost of making a pizza? And that's where this becomes so helpful because if we're talking about everything in terms of per hour, we can think about the trade-offs in terms of what each person could do with an hour of their time. So for example, in an hour, Pat can either make a fourth of a gallon of root beer or he can make half of a pizza. Therefore, since we can think of opportunity cost as what you have to give up in order to get something, 
we can say, well, if he wants to make half of a pizza, he has to give up one-fourth of a gallon of root beer. Or equivalently, the opportunity cost of half of a pizza is one-fourth of a gallon of root beer. And then we can just scale that up to determine the opportunity cost for an entire pizza. So we can use this logic to make yet another table, this time a table of opportunity costs. So here, like we said, if the opportunity cost of half of a pizza is one-fourth of a gallon of root beer, then the opportunity cost of one pizza is just twice what we have here, since one pizza is just two halves of a pizza. So we could say then that the opportunity cost of one pizza is one half of a gallon of root beer. So if we were going to say, what is Pat's opportunity cost of pizza? We'd say that's one half of a gallon of root beer. We could also calculate Chris's opportunity cost of pizza. So we start by thinking about, well, his opportunity cost of one fourth of a pizza is one sixth of a gallon of root beer because those are the two different things he could be doing with an hour of his time. So if he wants to make one-fourth of a pizza, he has to give up an hour of his time, and that hour of time would have created one-sixth of a gallon of root beer. Equivalently, we could say, well, one pizza is just four quarters of a pizza. So the opportunity cost of one pizza is going to be four times one over six, which is just four over six, or two thirds. So we could say here that Chris's opportunity cost of pizza is two thirds of a gallon of root beer. Now the problem didn't specifically ask for it, but we could also go through and calculate the opportunity cost of root beer as well, and it's good practice to at least see how these things work. So here for Pat, if Pat wants to make a quarter of a gallon of root beer, he has to give up half of a pizza. And again, since a full gallon of root beer is just four quarters, then if he wanted to make one gallon of root beer, he has to give up four times half of a pizza. So his opportunity cost of a gallon of root beer is actually four times one half, or two pizzas. And we can also think about Chris's opportunity cost of root beer. Well, in order to make one sixth of a gallon of root beer, he has to give up one fourth of a pizza. So in order to scale that up, we'd say here, well then if he, to make one gallon of root beer, which is just six sixths, he has to give up six times one over four pizzas, or six over four equals three over two. So his opportunity cost of a gallon of root beer is three over two pizzas. So there's a few things we can notice here. First off, you can check and make sure that you did this correctly by noticing that the opportunity cost of one of the goods and the opportunity cost of the other good for the same person, they should be reciprocals. So we see here, two and one half are reciprocals, as are three over two and two over three. So it seems like we've done things pretty much correctly here. You can also think about mathematically what's going on in order to get these numbers. And you'll notice that if we were take, to take this one fourth and to divide it by one half, we get one half. And if we were to take one half and divide it by one fourth, we would get two. So we can come up with a general rule for how to actually get these opportunity costs. So in general, we can say that the opportunity cost of root beer is the rate that we can make pizza at divided by the rate that we can make root beer at. So here we would just say, for example, for Chris, his opportunity cost of root beer is his rate of making pizza, which is one fourth, divided by his rate of making root beer, which is one sixth, which gave us exactly what we have here. So what you'll notice when setting up these ratios is that the opportunity costs are a ratio of the different rates, 
but also the opportunity cost of the good in question is the thing that goes on the bottom. Now, personally, I don't like using these because I find that they're really easy to forget. I don't like memorizing things because that can go wrong. So you don't actually have to memorize this and you don't actually have to do this division. That you always have the option of just using logic and scaling these trade-offs up or down as necessary, like we did to get these numbers in the first place. So again, back to our question. So, so what, is, what is each roommate's opportunity cost of making a pizza? Well, that's just what we did right here. So, so who has the absolute advantage in making pizza? And also who has the comparative advantage in making pizza? So to understand this, we have to recall what these terms actually mean. So when one person has an absolute advantage in making good, it just means that they're better, they're more productive in making that good. So we can think about that in terms of what we have here. We can either say that in an absolute sense, a person is more productive at making a good, either if it takes them less time to make the good, or if they can make that good faster. So we would say the absolute advantage goes to the person who either has a smaller time for the good or a higher rate for the good. So in this example, we would see, well, Pat can make a pizza faster. So Pat has the absolute advantage in pizza. Similarly, we could look here and say that Pat's rate of making pizza is, fa is faster, right? Because one half is greater than one fourth. So that again tells us that Pat has the absolute advantage in making pizza. We could also take that one step further and say who has the absolute advantage in making root beer. So in this example, Pat can also make root beer faster than Chris can. So Pat actually also has the absolute advantage in making root beer. And we could also see that here because Pat has a larger rate because one fourth is bigger than one sixth. He has a faster rate of making root beer. So it turns out Pat is actually better in a productivity sense of making both of the goods. In an economic sense, he has an absolute advantage in both of the goods. Comparative advantage, on the other hand, doesn't look specifically at either times or rates like we did here, but comparative advantage instead looks at who has the lower opportunity cost of making a particular good. So in order to look at comparative advantage, we want to be looking at our table of opportunity costs. And we can see here that in order to make a pizza, Pat has to give up a half of a gallon of root beer. And to make one pizza, Chris has to give up two-thirds of a gallon of root beer. And we say that comparative advantage goes to the party that has a lower opportunity cost of production. So we could say because one half is less than two-thirds, we can say that Pat has the comparative advantage in making pizza. We could, like we did before, take this analysis to root beer as well. And we'll note that in order to make a gallon of root beer, Pat has to give up or has an opportunity cost of two pizzas, whereas Chris only has an opportunity cost of one and a half pizzas. So actually, Chris has the lower opportunity cost here. So we can say that Chris has a comparative advantage in making root beer. And notice that unlike absolute advantage, where we found that Pat had an absolute advantage in both of the goods, that's not really possible with comparative advantage. Actually, by definition, or almost by construction, if one party has the comparative advantage in one of the goods, for example, in this case, Pat has the comparative advantage in pizza, then it has to be the case that the other party has the comparative advantage in the other good. Here, that implies that Chris has the comparative advantage in root beer. Part B of the problem asks, if Pat and Chris trade foods with each other, who will trade away pizza in exchange for root beer? If we were talking about this as if Pat and Chris were countries, this would be equivalent to saying who would export pizza and import root beer. And as it turns out, if we're going to have efficient trade or voluntary trade happening, each party is going to want to produce and sell or trade away 
that thing in which he has a comparative advantage. So in this case, we determined that Pat had a comparative advantage in pizza, and Chris had a comparative advantage in root beer. So it must be the case that Pat is going to trade away pizza for root beer, and that Chris is going to trade away a root beer for pizza. The last part of the problem asks about what prices these two parties would be willing to trade at. So the price of pizza can be expressed in terms of gallons of root beer. What is the highest price at which pizza can be traded that would make both roommates better off? And what is the lowest price? So to see this, we can think about these opportunity costs. So we already noted that in this exchange, Pat was going to be the seller of pizza. He's going to be exporting, he's going to be trading away pizza. And we noticed that Chris, because he was going to be the seller of root beer, trading away root beer, he's going to be the buyer of pizza. So the person that has the comparative advantage in a good is the seller and the other party is the buyer. That's an easy way to think about it. So we can think about here just through the logic of buying and selling, well, if it costs you a half of a gallon of root beer to make a pizza, you'd be willing to sell at prices that at least cover your cost. So from the selling perspective, Pat would say, well, it costs me half of a gallon of root beer, therefore I'm willing to sell pizzas at prices higher than half of a gallon of root beer. On the buying side, people in general and you know rational individuals such as hopefully Chris here would be willing to buy a good if they can get it more cheaply than it would cost them to produce it themselves. So what that implies here is that Chris would be willing to buy pizza at a price up to two-thirds of a gallon of root beer because at all prices up until that point he can get pizza for a lower opportunity cost or a lower cost than he would have if he produced the pizza himself. If we wanted to come up with a general rule for these prices, we could say that these parties would be willing to trade at prices that are in between the opportunity cost of the seller and the opportunity cost of the buyer. So as long as the price is greater than or equal to the opportunity cost of whoever's selling, so they're covering that seller's cost, and smaller than the opportunity cost of the buyer, so we're not charging the buyer more than it would cost the buyer to make the good himself, that any price in this range is going to make both parties better off. So in this example, any price for pizza between a half a gallon of root beer and two-thirds of a gallon of root beer is going to make both parties better off when Pat is selling pizza and Chris is buying pizza. Now you'll notice that that doesn't narrow it down to one particular price. What price actually happens between these two numbers depends on a lot of other factors including bargaining power and things like that.